Hi all, today we're going to be looking at the poem Portrait of a Loaf of Bread by Oswald and Buyaseni and Charlie. Now I'm Charlie, born in 1940 in Freyheit, Natal, um, wrote in both English and Zulu and he drew deeply on his life in Johannesburg and in the township of Soweto. He is an award-winning poet who won the Olive Schreiner Prize in, for 1974 for his first collection of poems called Sounds of a Cowhide Drum. He studied abroad in the United States at the University of Iowa and Columbia University, after which he returned to South Africa and taught at a school in Soweto. The apartheid government also banned one of his books, his second volume of poems called Fire Flames. And it's because it was dedicated to the school children of Soweto and there's a reference here to the uprising in 1976. And many of his poems actually reflected his harsh experiences under the apartheid regime. Now the poem we're going to be looking at today, Portrait of a Loaf of Bread, although it doesn't mention apartheid as such, one has to look at the time within which it was written and it really reflects the discrepancies between the haves and the have-nots. In other words, the affluent people who have the money to afford luxurious type of things and those who don't have that. So let's read the poem, Portrait of a Loaf of Bread. Look back to the rolling fields, waving gold-topped wheat stalks mowed by the reaper's scythe, bundled into sheaths, carted to the mill, ground into flour, kneaded into mountains of dough to be churned by rollers, and spat into pans as red-hot as Satan's cauldron, brought to the cafe, warmly wrapped in cellophane by Eat Fresh Bread Bakery Van, for the waiting cook to slice and toast, to butter and to marmalade for the food bedecked breakfast table. Whilst the labourer, with fingers caked with wet cement of a builder's scaffold, moulds a hunk in a cold drink, licks his lips and laughs, man can live on bread alone. As we look at how the poem itself is set out, the first stanza kind of represents the journey that a loaf of bread undergoes as it moves from the fields where it grows, through the harvest, through it being carted to the mill, turned into flour, dough, and eventually into bread. So there's this kind of action as to how the bread moves. In the stanza two and stanza three, we can see a contrast between where the bread ends up. So that same loaf of bread that's gone through the same processes could either end up on this food bedecked breakfast table or it can be used to feed a builder and you can see in that this kind of discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots in society so there's a kind of economic discrepancy between different people in society and of course it's important here to note the title of the poem portrait of a loaf of bread now generally a portrait in terms of art is a still life in other words, something that is stationary and a picture or an, a painting has been made of it. But in this case, this portrait, we see constant motion. We see a lot of the use of verbs and so on. So although it's a portrait of a loaf of bread, it doesn't adhere to what a portrait generally is. As we move into the first stanza, that stanza that kind of tracks the path of the bread as it moves from the wheat fields. We start off with these words, look back. So it kind of invites one to look back in time. There's definitely an imperative tone. It's almost like a command for the reader to kind of look back at what's happening. And what we get in this, in these first two lines is this kind of almost pastoral image of an idyllic countryside or landscape. We get the rolling fields, we get the waving gold-topped wheat stalks. Okay, now think for a moment the connotations of the word gold-topped. Okay, of course it's a reference to the color of the wheat stalks. And of course the wheat stalks here have already been harvested as you can see in this image on the right hand side over here. But the word gold over here kind of brings to mind a sense of opulence or a sense of richness okay so in other words the fields or the land itself provides this kind of richness that we have here 
There's also a nice use of personification over here because it says the fields are waving the wheat stalks. Okay, which is kind of a personification, a personified action over there. Now carries on to say that they were mowed by the reaper's scythe. Now I'd like to just spend a second on this word mowed over here. There's a certain sense of violence in this word, isn't there? Because for one thing, it could just mean to have been cut down. But here we have in the actual harvesting of the wheat, a sense of aggression or a sense of violence being done to this idyllic kind of landscape. Okay, so we can kind of see from it starting with this nice vision of these rolling fields and the gold topped wheat stalks, we can kind of see this discordant mood starting to come in here. And in that same line here, we see that it was mowed by the reaper's scythe. Now, of course, a scythe, as you can see in the little image to the right hand side over there, is an agric agricultural implement. But I think one needs to read a little bit more into this because when Charlie wrote this poem, there was already machinery doing the harvesting of wheat. So one needs to question why he would use the word scythe over here and the reaper's scythe. And there's definitely a reference here to the Grim Reaper, which kind of, as we all know, the Grim Reaper is this mythological being that harvests one's soul when one dies. And so this kind of brings, as well as with the word mode, this kind of dark mood to what's happening over here. In other words, everything's not as great and idyllic as it might seem. Then we get the, the next few lines, and this is, of course, the path that the bread goes to. Now, I just wanted you to note the use of verbs here. So we move from these present participles with rolling and waving in the first two lines to the past participles in the next few lines. Mowed, bundled, carted, ground, kneaded, churned, spat, okay? And all of these denote the action. That's doing, being done to the wheat as it gets turned into the bread, okay? It goes to the mill, gets ground down into flour, that gets kneaded and becomes the dough that the bread gets made out of, churned by rollers. And then it says it is spat into pans as red hot as Satan's cauldron. Now look at that simile for a second. So it's comparing the pans that the dough gets put into to be baked as being as hot as Satan's cauldron. Now there's once again this kind of dark imagery over here that one also saw with the reaper's scythe. We also see that that could link to the final line of the poem, but we'll talk about that when we get to that line over there. Also interestingly enough here is this repetition of the S sound over here, a kind of sibilance in these last few lines, just to remind you sibilance is a repetition of an S sound in a few lines of poetry or literature. Now, as we move into stanza two and stanza three, there's evidence of the stark contrast between the opulence of stanza two and the economic hardships evident in stanza three. And of course, the same loaf of bread that's produced in the same way gets consumed in two different manners over here. So in stanza two, we first of all see that it's brought to this cafe, which is kind of what we call a coffee shop nowadays. Okay, so it's not like a corner shop or a spaza shop or something like that. Okay, so somewhere that you can sit down and have a meal. And it goes on to say that it is warmly wrapped in cellophane. And of course, cellophane here is our plastic that we cover the bread in. It's interesting here to notice the use of the word warmly. And of course, the connotations of it being warmly wrapped is that there's a certain sense of care or love that goes into the preparation of that wrapping of the bread over there. Notice also the repetition of the W sound over there. Even though it's mostly silent, it's still the repetition of that letter over there. And it's brought here to the cafe by your Eat Fresh Bread Bakery van. And it's coming to the waiting cook. Now it's interesting to note here that the only person we see in this stanza is a laborer of sorts, this cook. Just like in the first stanza, we had the person working in the fields actually harvesting the wheat. In the third stanza, we have the laborer that works 
on the building site over there. So here we have this cook waiting to slice and to toast the bread. Now, if we think about this, the careful preparation that goes into the slicing and the toasting of the bread, okay? We need to contrast that with the word malls, a hunk, okay, in stanza three. So to slice means to carefully cut it into slices so that it can be toasted, whereas to maul something means to kind of rip it apart, okay? So there's a very big difference in those two words over there. But of course, this cook in the cafe very carefully prepares us with the butter and the marmalade and very importantly we have this food bedecked breakfast table in other words it's almost like there's too much food for the person sitting at the table to eat okay so there's that sense of opulence of having enough of having too much even possibly and we're moving to the next stanza the last stanza of the poem and it starts off with this word whilst in other words while this is happening with that same type of loaf of bread, we have the laborer on the other hand. And this laborer, we can see that his fingers are caked with wet cement from the scaffolding that he works on. Okay. In other words, he's consumed in the hard labor of his life. Now think of the relevance of the word cement over here. Cement something that binds things together. And what's evident in this moment here is that this laborer is actually one of the people that kind of binds together society itself okay in the same way that cement holds things together so in other words without people doing these type of things society couldn't function but yet as important as this person is there's still the stark contrast between the economic situation of the person eating in the cafe and the economic situation of the person building Okay, so he has this terrible discrepancy within society, almost a kind of unfair um, way that the economic situation has unfolded over here. And this laborer here, it says that he mauls a hunk. Okay, and this is the bread over here. And this maul, of course, is very different to the slicing that is happening in the previous stanza and this signifies a kind of desperation he's so hungry here that he rips off a piece of the bread and he dines it with a cold drink lips licks his lips and laughs and he says man can live on bread alone now we have here a sardonic allusion to the bible because the bible says man shall not live on bread alone so what's the significance of this line one has to think a little bit about it over here and there can be various meanings to this line here. And one can think that this laborer is so desperate for food and in such a desperate economic situation that just to fill one's stomach is the main goal in life, that things like religion and so on is not really important. But you can also look at it that bread is also a kind of equalizer and that, that no matter where you are, who you are in society, you will still eat bread for sustenance. Right, so that's a basic breakdown of the poem. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe to it for more videos to come. Have a good day.